Today we're going to review the role of German doctors in leading and implementing Nazi policies. And we'll try to understand how Nazi medical policies were influenced by earlier American initiatives. And we'll also look at some concerning events impacting U.S. healthcare today in light of this history. But I'd first like to start by telling this family story. This is a Jewish family from a small town in what was then Czechoslovakia, depicted in a photo taken in the mid-1930s. The parents were Robert and Matilda, and their three children were Erwin, William, and Ilsa. In early 1939, Germany had already annexed their neighbor, Austria, a little over an hour's drive from their town. And it was expected that Hitler would soon invade their country, so the two sons planned to flee. Okay. So uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, as it was clear that Hitler was about to invade Czechoslovakia, the, the two sons standing in the back decided to flee. On the day before the Nazi invasion, Erwin and William left their home and traveled as undocumented migrants through, the, through southern Europe. And after a tortuous trip across the Mediterranean, they made their way to safe refuge in British-occupied Palestine. Their parents and sister remained under Nazi occupation, and after suffering the loss of their civil rights, seizure of their property, and starvation, they were deported to concentration camps. They were murdered at Auschwitz probably sometime in 1944. Prior to her death, their young sister Ilsa, then in her early 20s, suffered gruesome torture in the guise of medical experimentation under the supervision of Dr. Joseph Mengele. And by the way, the taller young man, William, is my father. I never got to meet my grandparents or aunt. Joseph Mengele received doctorates in anthropology and medicine from Munich University. He joined the Nazi party in 1937 and the SS in 1938. He was initially assigned as a battalion medical officer in 1939. He was transferred to concentration camp service in early 1943 and assigned to Auschwitz, where he conducted deadly experimentations on human subjects. He was also one of the team of doctors responsible for the selection of victims to be killed in the gas chambers. Arrivals deemed able to work were admitted into the camp and those considered unfit for labor were immediately killed in the gas chambers. After the war, assisted by a network of former SS members, he sailed to Argentina in July 1949. In spite of extradition requests by West Germany and clandestine operations by Mossad, Mengele eluded capture. He drowned while swimming off the Brazilian coast in 1979 and was buried under a false name. His remains were disinterred and positively identified by forensic exam in 1985. Mengele has often been depicted as a twisted aberration and a cruel monster. I grew up viewing him this way. But as I later learned from studying the history of Nazi medicine, Mengele was really very typical of the majority of German doctors. He was far from alone as a perpetrator of medical torture and the concentration camp experiments were the culmination of a long series of inhumane acts by the Nazi medical profession. These acts were so profound that after the trial of the main Nazi leaders at Nuremberg, there was a separate trial devoted entirely to doctors, which opened in December 1946. The 23 defendants you see here were charged with war crimes and crimes against humanity, including extermination of the mentally ill and handicapped, conducting cruel and brutal experiments with non-consenting prisoners. 16 of the 23 were found guilty. Seven were sentenced to death and executed on June 2, 1948. Of the nine defendants sentenced to prison, eight had their sentences commuted, and seven were released by 1962. 
Among the seven acquitted doctors, some continued to practice medicine and others worked for the German pharmaceutical industry. Four Nuremberg doctor defendants were at some time later employed by the US military. Much has been written about both the gruesome Nazi medical experiments and the profound impact of the Nazi doctor's trial on medical ethics and the protection of human subjects. But I'm not going to focus on these aspects today. Instead, I'd like to look at the roots of Nazi medicine, the sources of its popularity, and the essential role of Nazi doctors in the implementation of broader Nazi policies. The doctors tried in Nuremberg were merely the tip of the iceberg of a corrupt German medical profession, which prior to 1933 was the most prestigious in the world. Nazi ideology was popular and even ordinary among German doctors, who were responsible for both planning and implementing Nazi genocide. They ran the sterilization and euthanasia programs, selected individuals for extermination, and then falsified death certificates. Nurses assisted in these acts. Healthcare professionals had central roles as state executioners. In 1929, the National Socialist Physicians League was formed to purify the medical community of so-called Jewish Bolshevism. 6% of the profession joined the League before Hitler came to power. Doctors joined the Nazi party earlier and in greater numbers than any other profession. By 1942, about 38,000, half the doctors in Germany had joined the party, compared with only 9% of the general population. 7% of, of physicians joined the elite SS, giving them ultimate control over life and death, <coughs> compared with 0.5% among all Germans. Did they have a choice? Well, in German-occupied Netherlands, Physicians actively resisted cooperation with the Nazis, even after 100 of them were shipped to concentration camps. Leo Alexander, an American psychiatrist who testified for the prosecution at Nuremberg, stated, quote, It's obvious that if the medical profession of a small nation under the conqueror's heel could resist so effectively, the German medical profession could likewise have resisted had they not taken the fatal first step. Here's Dr. Alexander with a victim of Nazi medical experimentation at the trial. A few German doctors did resist, mainly socialists and communists, but they were rare. A.C. Ivey, another Nuremberg prosecution medical expert and prominent physician and physiologist, stated, quote, had the profession taken a strong stand against the mass killing of sick Germans before the war, it's conceivable that the entire idea and technique of death factories would not have materialized. Far from opposing the Nazi state militantly, part of the German medical profession cooperated consciously and even willingly, while the remainder acquiesced in silence." Unquote. This photo shows a boycott notice placed on the door of a Jewish doctor's office in 1933, soon after Hitler came to power. It came from Gerhard Wagner, also depicted on this slide, who was chair of the new National Socialist College of Physicians, which he co-founded in 1932. Wagner fought in World War I and then studied medicine in Munich. He joined the Nazi party in 1929 and died of unknown causes in 1939. Well, why was Nazism so popular among German physicians? They were mainly conservative, attracted to racism as a biological concept, and intrigued by medicalizing a broad range of societal problems. Also, Jews were disproportionately represented among German physicians, particularly in Berlin and in academic positions. And the expulsion of Jews from their positions starting in 1933 was in the economic interest of Nazi physicians, as the number of Jewish physicians, physicians was roughly equivalent to the number of unemployed non-Jewish physicians. 
The medical profession grew under the Nazis with higher salaries and status, coincident with their leadership roles in implementing Nazi policies. This is a Nazi anti-smoking poster. The Nazis supported research in ecology, public health, carcinogenesis, human genetics, criminal biology, racial hygiene, and sociobiology. They banned smoking in public buildings, supported midwifery, homeopathy, and diets high in fruit and fiber, and they stressed the importance of preventive medicine. It's important to understand that Nazi racial policy emerged from the medical and scientific community rather than imposing itself upon it. Hitler is described here as doctor of the German people. Racial hygiene was said to provide long-term preventive care for the German germplasm. Jews, homosexuals, Roma, and communists became illness personified. Nazi leaders referred to their system as applied biology. Medical faculties became the premier academic disciplines. Physician participation lent legitimacy to Nazi policies. Medical exams often served as disguises for murder. Heinrich Himmler, leader of the SS, recognized the benefit of doctors as executioners, and in 1943, ordered that only physicians trained in anthropology could perform selections for the gas chambers, as depicted in this photo. Backing up a bit in history, from the mid-19th century, German physicians increasingly saw themselves as more responsible for the health of the nation than for the good of the individual patient. Here, a weary Aryan is shown shouldering the burden of so-called defective patients with the cost of their care described. After World War I, the fields of racial hygiene and eugenics became more popular, with rising concern about so-called defective and inferior people and their cost to society. In 1920, a popular pamphlet appeared entitled The Sanctioning of the Destruction of Life Unworthy of Living. The authors lamented, quote, what a tremendous amount of capital was being withheld from the gross national product in terms of food, clothing, and heat, all for an unproductive purpose, unquote. The main criteria for killing people in this pamphlet were to be lack of productive output, a state of complete helplessness, and needing the care of others. The term Labens and Wirtensleben, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, correctly. Um, life unworthy of life became part of the Nazi lexicon. Another important Nazi term was racial hygiene, which was used to classify superior and inferior races, as depicted in this pyramid. Most of the 20 university institutes for racial hygiene and the 15 journals in this field were established in Germany before the Nazis came to power. The three main racial hygiene programs of the Nazis were sterilization, the Nuremberg Laws, and euthanasia. And doctors played a central role in each of them. I'm going to describe each of these in the following slides. The 1933 Law for the Prevention of Progeny of Hereditary Disease prohibited the reproduction of persons deemed genetically inferior. A genetic health court of one judge and two physicians decided on forced sterilization. Here, doctors caring for the mentally ill are depicted with the caption, life only as a burden. Doctors were required to register all cases of hereditary illness. There were 400,000 victims of sterilization, and 5,000 died from the operations, mainly women. Most victims were German Gentiles, diagnosed as feeble-minded, followed by schizophrenia and epilepsy. 
The Nazis praised other nations with compulsory sterilization laws, like the US. You can see the US flag in the upper right. The Nazis admired the US as global leaders in what they called race law. In fact, the roots of medical fascism come from our own backyard. Before 1933, the US led the world in forced sterilizations. Here you can see all the striped and black states with current or pending sterilization laws in 1935. From 1907 to 1939, over 30,000 people in 29 states were sterilized while in prison or mental institutions. Eugenics, a theory that applied Darwin's principles to society, was popular in the US, England, and Germany. Here's an American poster supporting eugenic sterilization, which was viewed as a progressive program. Eugenicists believed, believed the human race could be improved by limiting reproduction of inferior people and promoting it among the superior. German racial hygienists prior to the, to the Nazis expressed admiration for America's achievements and warned that unless Germany made progress, America would become the world's racial leader. Over 65,000 people were sterilized in the US under these programs. Sterilization in North Carolina, from where I relo relocated two years ago, was widespread and highest in Mecklenburg County, where Charlotte is located. That's the red area on the map. The peak of the, of the program was from 1946 to 1968, continuing well after the Nazi experience. Here's a plaque in Raleigh memorializing the North Carolina eugenics program, which affected over 7,600 people through 1973. Back in Germany, although the Nazi sterilization law was annulled in 1945, those sterilized received no restitution and were not viewed as Nazi victims by German authorities after the war. It's important to understand that among so-called healthy German women, sterilization and abortion were illegal, and birth control was severely curtailed for so-called Aryans under the Nazis. The Nuremberg Law laws of 1935 were the second racial hygiene program. These excluded Jews from citizenship and prevented marriage or sexual relations with non-Jews. They were considered public health measures administered primarily by physicians. Again, the United States was admired for its racial policy. US anti-black statutes were viewed by the Nazis as stricter than the Nuremberg laws. In several southern states, a person with 132nd black ancestry was considered black while in Germany, one could be one-eighth Jewish and still be considered an Aryan. American laws restricting black-white marriage and other racist statutes were frequently cited in German publications. The Nazis also looked positively at the conquest of Native Americans in the American West as an example of the extermination of what was considered an inferior race. In 1938, the American Medical Association rejected the request of 5,000 black physicians to join, an event widely reported in, the, in German medical journals. Between 1948 and 1965, over 10 proposals to expand African American membership in the AMA were debated and rejected by their House of Delegates. In this quote from 1938, the prominent African-American physician, Lewis Wright, compared the AMA's restrictive racial admission policies with those of Hitler. And the hospital where I worked in Charlotte was segregated to both African-American patients and physicians until 1963. 
1941, a prominent neurologist discussing children with intellectual disabilities called for, quote, euthanasia for those hopeless ones who should never have been born, nature's mistakes. These should be relieved of the burden of living, because for them, the burden of living at no time can produce anything good at all. This quote was not from a Nazi, but from the leading American neurologist, Foster Kennedy, presenting at the American Psychiatric Association a paper published in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 1942, at the same time the US was at war with Nazi Germany. Kennedy argued that severely retarded children over five should be put to death. In August 1939, the third Nazi racial hygiene ordinance obligated doctors and midwives to register newborns with deformities to health authorities. Two pediatricians and a child psychiatrist reviewed these reports and decided on life or death for these children. In October 1939, Hitler empowered physicians to grant euthanasia to patients considered incurable according to the best available human judgment of their state of health. The term euthanasia was a euphemism for exterminating the mentally ill and handicapped. A secret meeting of all German mayors took place in Berlin in 1940. Dr. Victor Brock, who was later tried and hanged at Nuremberg, spoke, quote, in the many mental institutions of the Reich, there are an infinite number of incurably ill patients of all kinds who are completely useless to humanity. In fact, they are nothing but a burden. Their care creates endless expense, and there's no possibility that these people will ever become healthy or useful members of human society. They vegetate like animals and are antisocial people unworthy of living. But otherwise, their internal organs are healthy, and they could live on for many decades. They only take nourishment away from other healthy people and often need two or three times as much care. Other people must be protected from these people. Here are the major euthanasia centers across greater Germany. Brock continued, quote, if, however, we must already make preparations for maintenance of healthy people, then it is all the more necessary first to eliminate these beings, if only to better maintain curable patients in mental hospitals. The space that would then become free is needed for all sorts of things important to the war effort. Thus, those seriously ill, that is, incurable patients who are involved, must be packed into very primitive special asylums where everything must be done in order to have them die as quickly as possible. In order to carry out this operation, a commission of physicians has been appointed to decide which patients should be sent to such asylums." Brock emphasized that gassings should be carried out only by physicians because, quote, the needle belongs in the hands of the doctor, unquote. Brock came from a middle class family and joined the Nazi party in SS in 1929 at the age of 25. By 1940, he was promoted to SS Oberführer, or Senior Colonel. He was executed on June 2, 1948. Meticulous records documented over 70,000 deaths by gassing at six euthanasia centers between 1940 and 41, with detailed estimated savings from the killings. By midsummer 1941, the staff at the Hadamar Death Center, depicted here, celebrated the cremation of their 10,000 patients uh, with beer and wine served in the crematorium. Although the official euthanasia program ended in 1941, actual killings of the handicapped continued in some asylums weeks after the Allied occupation. Ernst Illing was a neurologist and one of the main perpetrators of the Children's Euthanasia Program in Vienna. He attended medical school in Leipzig and joined the Nazi party in 1933. As head of the Children's Department at the Brandenburg Gordon Asylum and the Spielbrunn Clinic, he supervised the killing of children with a variety of chronic conditions. 
He was sentenced to death and executed in Vienna in 1946. Heinrich Gross, who was a psychiatrist, worked at the Steinhoff Institute and in the murder pavilion of the Spiegelbrunn Clinic, where he conserved the brains of most murdered children, which he continued to study until the 1950s. He was given his own Institute for Brain Research in 1968 from the Austrian government. He lived unprosecuted in Austria until his death in 2005. This is the euthanasia ward where doctors Illing and Gross work. Alfred Wodel was a young child with polyarthritis. His mother Anna, both of them depicted here, tried desperately but unsuccessfully to save him from euthanasia. This is the gravestone for Alfred Wodel, who was murdered at the Spiegelbrunn Clinic under the supervision of doctors Illing and Gross in 1941. Here's the grave site of other child victims of euthanasia from the Spielberg Clinic in Vienna. The upper stone block reads, never forgotten, and the lower stone block reads, in memory of the children and adolescents who fell victim to Nazi euthanasia as life unworthy of life from 1940 to 45 in the former children's hospital, A.M. Spielberg dedicated by the town of Vienna in 2002. Here's a photo secretly taken in 1940 at the Schloss Hartheim Extermination Center with its smoking chimney, directed by Dr. Rudolf Lonauer. Lonauer, who's on the right in this photo, joined the Nazi party in 1931 and the SS in 1933. He directed Hartheim from 1940 to 45. As the war was ending, Lonauer killed himself, killed himself and his family in May 1945. In July 1945, the prominent neurologist Julius Halliburton showed his collection of brains to Dr. Leo Alexander, the American psychiatrist and Nuremberg expert witness. Halliburton said that he specifically requested brains from victims of euthanasia because, quote, there was wonderful material among the, these brains, beautiful mental defectives, malformations, and early infantile disease. I accepted these brains, of course. Where they came from and how they came to me was really none of my business, unquote. The Halliburton collection was used at the Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt until 1990 when the brains were finally buried in the, in the Munich Cemetery. Many of these brains came from children from the Brandenburg Gordon Asylum, murdered on a single day in October 1940, when Halliburton was alleged to be present. Up to 250,000 handicapped people were killed from 1939 to 1945. After the war, only 15% of the pre-war psychiatric hospital population in Germany re remained alive. Most families accepted this murder of their relatives, usually with false diagnoses. By doing so, they were thought to create the psychological conditions for the genocidal policies carried out in the years to come. Those of you in the audience with medical backgrounds may recognize Halliburton's name associated with the Halliburton Spots Syndrome. I'm not going to dwell on too much detail here, but this slide and the next one show the names of eight Nazi doctors and collaborators who've had eponyms for various medical conditions and procedures. And the tables also list the recommended alternative names supported in recent years by international medical societies. These eight doctors did not simply have the misfortune of working during the Nazi era. They were all either active Nazis who played direct roles in atrocities or who built their careers on specimens known to result from Nazi murders. And most continued their careers unpunished after the war. Hal Gordon succeeded a dismissed Jew as head of the neuropathology department of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Brain Research in 1938. 
After the war, he continued to work at the Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt until his retirement, and he died in 1965. Hans Eppinger directed a prominent internal medicine clinic in Vienna. He conducted cruel experiments on Roma prisoners at Dachau. Eppinger committed suicide with poison one month before he was testified to testify at Nuremberg. MJB Ibrahim, a pediatrician, played an active role from 1941 in killing sick and mentally ill children in the Nazi euthanasia program, and he died in 1952. Hans Reiter, a bacteriologist, joined the Nazi party in 1932 and had several medical leadership roles, encouraging the fanatical teaching of racial hygiene in universities. He continued his international prominence until his death in 1969. Hans Scherer was another prominent German neuropathologist. During the war, working in Breslau, he studied the brains of over 300 Polish and German children euthanized in the Logan Psychiatric Clinic. He died in a bomb attack near the end of the war in 1945. Hugo Spatz was a prominent German psychiatrist who built his fame by studying the brains of children killed in the euthanasia project. After the war, he worked at the United States Aero Medical Center in Heidelberg, and he died in 1969. Walter Steckel was an internationally acclaimed obstetrician gynecologist who was responsible for the expulsion of Jewish doctors from the German Society of Gynecology in 1933, and he died in 1969. And Friedrich Wegner was a pathologist and dedicated Nazi in 1932, and a member of the Brown Shirts. He was suspected of being involved in atrocities at the Lodz Ghetto in Poland, Poland, but never stood trial. He died in 1990. Many of you might be familiar with the name Asperger. Austrian pediatrician Hans Asperger, an earlier research, an early researcher in autism whose name is associated with what was previously called Asperger's syndrome, but is now considered part of the autism spectrum, sent several disabled children to be killed at the Spielberg Clinic. Though he was never a member of the Nazi party, he joined several affiliated organizations and publicly supported racial hygiene policies like forced sterilization and euthanasia. After the war, Asperger was chairman of pediatrics at the University of Vienna for 20 years. Edward Pernkoff uh, was an uh, anatomist and physician. Uh, he was responsible for writing this book, which is quite famous in medical circles, uh, uh, considered to be perhaps the most beautiful anatomic drawings ever published. Um, he, uh, joined the Nazis early uh, in 1933, joined the uh, Brown Shirts in 1934. Um, by 1938, when uh, Hitler took over, uh, annexed uh, Austria, uh, where he was located in Vienna, um, he was dean of the uh, medical school in Vienna. So he was personally responsible for the dismissal of 77% of the that uh, medical school's faculty, which included all the Jews and four Nobel laureates. Um, he survived the war, and though he spent some time in a prisoner of war camp, was never prosecuted. And uh, the continued use of his anatomy text, which has gone through multiple other editions uh, since then, uh, is still uh, very controversial in medical circles. This poster from 1938 reads, 60,000 Reichsmarks is what this person suffering from a hereditary defect cost the people, people's community during his lifetime. Fellow citizen, that is your money too. Unquote. Forced euthanasia freed up hospital beds as the war started. Yet even before 1933, there was concern with the rising cost of psychiatric care and the perception of, quote, growing numbers of hopelessly disabled people who consume so much of the gross national product, unquote. 
This minutely detailed list of savings from extermination of so-called defectives was found by U.S. soldiers in 1945. It calculated that the murder of 70,000 people would save 885 million Reichsmarks over 10 years. Popular Nazi school math textbook problems included, quote, the construction of a lunatic asylum cost 6 million marks. How many houses at 15,000 marks each could have been built for that amount, unquote. Another exercise was, quote, how many new housing units could be built and how many marriage allowance loans could be given to newly wedded couples for the amount of money it cost the state to care for the crippled, the criminal, and the insane, unquote. The decision to exterminate Jews and others in gas chambers beginning in 1942 was based on prior experience in the euthanasia program. Equipment used to gas patients in the euthanasia program was moved in 1941 to the concentration camps in the east, and the same doctors, nurses, and technicians often followed close behind. SS physicians did the selection of concentration camp arrivals for the gas chamber. The euthanasia program was the beginning of the larger medicalized genocide. Only a handful of Nazi physician leaders were brought to trial, and many were pardoned after brief sentences. Most remained in their esteemed positions. Many post-war German medical leaders were Nazis. The German medical profession systematically blocked internal discussion of their complicity with Nazi crimes until 1980. As of 1990, tissue samples from Holocaust victims were still being used at German medical schools. And then I neglected to say we're talking about Pernkopf's atlas that many of the drawings were done on, on Nazi victims. In 1949, Leo Alexander warned American physicians of the dangerous precedent of harsher dehumanizing attitudes towards the chronically ill and handicapped. Starting with the view, quote, that there is such a thing as life not worthy to be lived. This attitude in its early stages concerned itself merely with the severely and chronically sick. Gradually, the sphere of those to be included in the category was enlarged to encompass the socially unproductive, the ideologically unwanted, the racially unwanted, and finally all non-Germans. But it's important to realize that the infinitely small wedged in lever from which this entire trend of mind received its impetus was the attitude toward the non-rehabilitatable sick, unquote. In the US in 1949, Alexander continued, quote, hospitals like to limit themselves to the care of patients who can be fully rehabilitated. And a patient whose full rehabilitation is unlikely finds himself at least in the best and most advanced centers of healing, as a second-class patient forced, faced with a reluctance to suggest and apply therapeutic procedures that are not likely to bring about immediately striking results in terms of recovery. This point of view did not arise primarily within the medical profession, but it was imposed by the shortage of funds available, both private and public. From the attitude of easing patients with chronic diseases away from the doors, of the best types of treatment facilities available, to the actual dispatching of such patients to killing centers is a long but nevertheless logical step." Unquote. Some current events make Alexander's warning even more compelling today. And I include just, just a few examples. In 2017, the CEO of the Mayo Clinic, a physician, announced a change in preference for privately insured patients over those with Medicaid. This is just one of many examples of increasing disparities between the health care available to the rich versus the poor. And most of the current physician members of the US Congress, and there are about 30 or so, have endorsed policies that increase harm to those in need. Are the lives of the poor less worthy? We've seen increases in harsh, dehumanizing immigration enforcement. These policies have made immigrants fearful of getting needed care. 
and the language we hear from the highest levels of government is growing in divisiveness and devalues the lives of people based on race, religion, and nationality. William Seidelman, a Canadian family physician, has told the story of the Greek island of Kos, depicted here, the birthplace of Hippocrates, where many physicians still travel to retake the Hippocratic Oath at the temple of Aesculapius, the Greek god of medicine. Seidelman reflects, and this is a long quote, an oft-visited site in the town of Kos is an ancient plane tree where, legend has it, Hippocrates taught under its branches. Seeds from the plane tree of Hippocrates have been distributed around the world as part of an effort to disseminate the Hippocratic spirit. In the summer of 1944, Coast was occupied by the German military. On July 23rd, the 120 Jews of Coast were assembled at the harbor near the plane tree of Hippocrates. From there, they were transported to the Greek mainland, and from there, they were conveyed by train to Auschwitz. Upon arrival at the rail siding in the Birkenau complex, the Jews of Hippocrates' birthplace were met on the ramp by the professional descendants of Hippocrates. Those licensed SS physicians who had been selected to select made a diagnosis on each of the Jews of Kos that he or she was a useless life and should receive the great therapy of Auschwitz, which was death in the central hospital of Auschwitz. There they all perished. Today, the island of Kos and the empty synagogue of Kos, which adjoins the plain tree of Hippocrates, symbolize the spiritual crisis of medicine arising from the Holocaust a crisis that medicine has failed to recognize, let alone resolve, unquote. So, will we recognize the warning signs already upon us? Changing priorities in healthcare, harsh and dehumanizing attitudes towards immigrants, the poor and powerless, increasing racism and economic disparity, physician leaders initiating and supporting legislation that attacks the health of the majority of the population? Are these small wedged in levers that Dr. Alexander warned us about? Can we afford complacency in the face of these conditions? These are some of the questions to ponder as we reflect on the lessons of Nazi medicine. <laughs>